Um, I've I've been involved with um, reinstruction projects for water voles, also for approximately um, the course of the last quarter century. And in that time, I think we bred somewhere in the region of about 26,000 of these tiny creatures that were once so familiar that Kenneth Graham used them for his character of Ratty in Wind in the Willows, who was this kind of steadfast Biggles type character with a four and a half hat and a pipe who liked to scull up and down the Windrush for this pal the mole. But you know, we're losing them. We live in a time when I think the vast majority of us that you know, exist in society drive through landscapes which are green and they still think they're in good heart. This year, I've been lucky to, to visit very many estates the length and breadth of England to, to have a look at projects that generally involve rewilding and to talk to the, the owners of those, 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 those a, a younger generation of landowners who are inheriting them and who wish to change um, the way they work. It's been a sobering experience, it has to be said, because um, you know what you find is that as you go along, um, you know, you'll find tiny little populations of red squirrels, tiny populations of adders, tiny populations of water voles. But these are all things that are stuck in time. They're all dwindling. And the overall impression you come away with, with very few exceptions, is, is of landscape scale loss, which is truly horrifying. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to talk to you about beavers. Beavers are a very important creature. Um, they are the architect of life. They're the creature that creates living space for a whole host of other, other species that without them simply can't exist. So if we're actually truly serious about much of the bunkum we listen to uh, with regard to COP and, and, and the climate emergencies, you see announced tediously time and again We've really got to sort of start to look at what we can do to make it better. And beavers as the engineers of wetland, which is the richest living landscape on the planet, are the very first step. So without any further ado, we'll start with the slides. First slide. Can you pinch that out, Simon? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's now um, that should be full screen for everyone, Derek. So, you okay, just, so I'll start uh, starting of the beaver. The beaver yeah. is a species we have known as as humans or as uh, as as primates for a very long time. Next slide. When we be began as a species ourselves to recolonize British environments. 500,000 years ago at places like Boxgrove and, and Sussex and, and to live in the wetlands that, that, that were there because they gave us a great abundance of fish and waterfowl. They offered safe refuge um, you know, against predators because, of course, we were prey in those days and, and the big grazing animals came down to eat. Um, you know, along the and, and the lush reed beds and and herb meadows that lined their sides, we were living and preferentially selecting beaver generated environments. Next slide. And beavers, of course, were, were a very important thing for us. Um, they were basically living toolkits. We could use, they're a big rodent. They can weigh, um, you know, upwards of 20, 25 kilos. So you're looking at a rodent that's approximately the size of a small deer. Um, you can use their, their, their teeth for dice. You can use their fur, which is soft and lustrous, um, for a variety of different purposes, as, as bags, as blankets for babies. There were a whole range of different reasons that weren't sophisticated uh, in the way that um, the, 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 the late medieval fur trade was um, that, that we used um, from earlier times. Um, the tail could be used to make um, a holster or sheaths or knives. Their feet could be eaten. And, and then very importantly, um, again, as time and sophistication um, matured, we could use, we, we, we sought their anal glands, which they used to scent mark the territory for a substance called castoreum. Next slide. And there are all sorts of really lovely stories about beavers. So in the sixth century, um, um, when um, Bishop, um, when St. Felix um, came to, Ang uh, to Christianize the Angles um, from continental Europe, his ship was, um, was wrecked off the, the Suffolk coast. 
uh, on Norfolk coast in a place um, just above a, a tiny lost village now called Babingley. And when he was um, floundering in the water and nearly drowned, um, St. Felix was saved apparently um, by a family of beavers. And in, in, in just reward for their actions, he consecrated um, the king beaver as a, a, a chief beaver as an archbishop. And, um, and the Archbishop Beaver went on to um, administer a variety of different positions and, and, and church rights to, to the lothier of his king. Next slide. And here to this day in, in, in the gardens outside this lost village, you can see St. Felix, old, humble and bent, going for a walk in the forest, um, you know, under a mushroom type umbrella with his little friend, the Beaver, um, leaning up to hold his hand. Next slide. This, this was their downfall. So before, long before the fur trade kicked in and long before the glory days of the Hudson's Bay Company, um, people were killing beavers for these glands. Um, the castorium was, was an incredibly valuable compound. And, and, you know, really from all time, the Romans remarked on, on how um, efficacious it was for gout and, and rheumatism and, and all sorts of different maladies. And it was, a, it was an essential ingredient of pain relief at a time when pain relief was really something that there wasn't effective in very many other forms. Um, and what that meant was these two glands that, be, that exist at the base of the beaver's tail, which the beavers used to scent mark the territory. Um, one was worth one year's labor um, wages to a medieval laborer, and the other was worth another year's wages to a medieval laborer. And if you take into account the value of the rest of the animal's body, the reason why we killed beavers, the, the length and breadth, not just of Britain, but from the, 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 the western point in Britain up to the, 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 the northern rim with the, the edge of the Arctic Circle, living in landscapes that were perhaps frozen for six, seven months and feeding on dwarf willow, down to the kind of like balmy edge of the Mediterranean rim and to, to nations like Greece and right across into China and Korea was because we wanted this castoreum because it was so valuable. It was a major trade item and a major mercantile product. Next slide. And to produce it, the beavers had to die. There were all sorts of, 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 of bits of folklore and belief that you know, when a hunted beaver was pursued by a, 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 its assailant who wanted its glands, that it would climb to a promontory and, and, thus, and, and leave behind itself to castrate itself and, and give the glands, which people thought in the early Middle Ages were testes, um, over to the huntsman who would then spare its life. You know, it's, a, it's a, a nice story and it's, it's, it's homily, but at the end of the day, very few of their lives were ever spared by us. Next slide. Um, and we know that, you know, not only was the, uh, the Castorium a sought after item, but they're right the way into the, the, the early um, the years of, of, of the, the, the 11th and 12th century, um, that bundles of beavers far were being exported from, from rivers like the Tyne in the, in the reign of Henry I. Next slide. So we have, you know, when I started to work with the beaver, I was told that, you know, it was an animal that had gone a long, long time ago in Britain. That nobody could really understand what the fuss was about because there weren't very many of them. They were poorly recorded. And really, most of what people talked about, if indeed they talked about the animal at all, was of a time when you had a, a traveling monk called Geraldus de Cambrensis, who went on to become the Archdeacon of Brecon. And, and he recorded seeing beavers on, on the River Tyvee in Wales and remarked that. Um, you know, that there was the only river in the kingdom where they existed. But that belief came from the fact that we never really looked at. There was a, this lazy tendency in writers to, to look at what other people had written and not go back to look for any source material that was different. And as soon as a remarkable woman called Dr. Bryony Cole started to look for more information quite seriously in the early 2000s, she found it with relative ease. And one of the, the most wonderful quotes is from this guy, William Harrison. William Harrison was the, was the canon of Windsor, and he was a, an instrumental figure in, in the drafting of, the, of, the, of a thing that went on to be called the Vermin Act. It was a, an act for the preservation of grain to preserve you know, human foodstuffs from, from the incursions of wild animals. And as you might expect, it listed all sorts of different creatures that, that took food from us. 
And in one of his last paragraphs about mammals, he says, I might here also tell you something of the beaver, whose hind feet and tail only are supposed to be fish. Certainly the tail of the beast is like a thin whetstone as the body unto a monstrous rat. The beaver is also itself is a such force of the teeth. It will gnaw a hole through a thick plank or shear through a double billet in a night. It loveth the stillest of rivers. Well, I've worked with hundreds of beavers today. I've seen them in Europe. I've seen them in North America. And one of the first things that impresses you very firmly when you start to work with the species is the force and the power in their teeth. And I am quite sure that Harrison wasn't quoting anybody else. He was talking about British beavers 500 years after we thought the last had become extinct. Next slide. And there begins a detective story because, you know, none of these animals, the animals from the past, the wolves, the beavers, the moose, whatever else, they didn't simply fade from landscapes. We killed them and killed them all. And if you look at, in particular, the wolf, you know, we killed them with great relish and joy. None of these creatures, these great predators of sheep, if we caught them, died easily. We did things to them that were truly abominable. We don't think about what we did in the past anymore now. But when you start to look back and you start to pay attention to what was said, you catch these nasty vestigial hints of the brutality right the way through. In 1904, a guy called Edgar Bogg wrote a book called the kind of like the, it was the pleasurable landscapes of Upper Wharfdale. And like many late Victorian writers, he, he was a bit of a waffler. Lots of old, old tales you could never quite get to the bottom of. And he was the first to, to relate that there was a, a record at a place called Bolton Percy of a beaver being killed on a, at a location called Oak Beck in 1789. Next slide. So eventually, I think Bryony or one of her colleagues went to the, um, the parish register and decided to have a look. And there, sure enough, um, you know, in 1789, you've got John Swale being paid tuppence for the head of a beaver. And on the following page, the, 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 the parish clerk, um, the same man that recorded the payment of, of, of tuppence for a beaver, records that another individual's paid the shilling for a, the head of an otter. So that what it tells you is that man writing those words knew the difference between a beaver and an otter and that he was paying appropriately for different species which had a different worth. In more modern times, you know, I remember even speaking to Derek Yaldon, the great mammologist, who said, well, I just don't think it was right. I don't think beavers could have survived in Britain until 1789. But none of us can time travel. And as we can't time travel, we can't contradict the word adequately of the people who wrote at the time. Next slide. And Bog went on to say that, you know, actually, well, you know, when you, if you think it was a beaver, but that's probably wrong because the authorities are telling him that it's a, a broad-nosed otter, a flat-nosed otter, then, then this tuppence or thruppence that was paid was likewise paid for other animals by the wood reeves. And, and that the wood reeves paid these sums of money until times that were relatively late, times that were well approaching his time in 1904. Next slide. And the Woodreeves were an interesting bunch. They weren't exactly collaborators, but they were the kind of people who, when the Normans decided that they were going to, to make Britain this feudal kingdom and dispossess everybody that existed, be you high or low of your land, and revalue everything and give it basically to their own mates, then what they did was they rode through the landscape, picking individuals from community who could more or less be the tax collectors. So these were the guys who would live amongst you and would go and tell the Normans that actually the returns you were making for, you know, the palings in a forest were accurate or inaccurate. And, 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 and then upon this information that the Norman administrators would act. So they weren't always well loved. But the remit of the Woodreeves, as time went on, was not one of a gamekeeper. They weren't interested in deer or boar or otters or anything that did not directly affect and impact forest taxation. So it makes absolutely no sense at all that these people were paying pence for an otter. When an otter would have no effect on a forest, it makes complete sense that they would have paid the money for a beaver, which could have felled and, and flooded their valuable withy beds. Next slide. 
And so the story goes on. In June this year, I went to see this, this, this little old lady on the walker um, called Kathleen Birkinshaw. She's 91 years old. Um, she was a little girl of the 1930s. And, and just off to the, 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 the right-hand side of this bridge beneath, beneath a place called Wentworth Woodhouse, she remembers quite clearly seeing beavers building dams with her father when she was a girl of four. All the other members of her family who saw them are dead or are in Australia now. There's no way of verifying whether this woman was right or wrong. But if those animals, uh, this species, survived almost to the time of bog, then another 30 years of survival for an animal that had stood a thousand years of persecution is perhaps not impossible. Next slide. And it's just possible she's right. Once again, we can't time travel. We can't contradict her. It's incredible how snottiness creeps in when it comes to the anecdotal records of other people who are just individual humans. But the thing that makes it interesting, if you look at this map and you can see it at scale, is that off to the, 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 the right-hand side, you have Beverly and very many other place names that are Saxon record the presence of beavers. In the middle, you have um, the location of Bolton Percy beneath York. And right down to the bottom end, off to the left-hand side, um, you have Wentworth Woodhouse, which is where Kathleen remembers seeing her beavers. And all those, those markers are on tributaries of, of the Humber to the north and to the south. So if it, it was a made-up story, then it would make no sense to have it you know, there. But, but it's perhaps more than coincidence that when you start to look at the locations of these animals um, and the last of the records, they're all on one single massive river system that until modern times was still quite wild. Next slide. But we'll never know. What we do know is that the trade in Castoreum was significant and, and operated right the way from, from, from Western Europe through to China in the East. And that as a commodity, it was moved along the Silk Roads. There were many people, uh, you know, physicians and other learned individuals who remarked on its properties and its values and worth. But when you look at their writings, by the time you get to the 14 and 1500s, they're very confused about what animal it's actually come from. They don't know the animal anymore. The animal, which was a common and abundant species in the time of Pliny, you know, so that it filled Italy nearly full and, the, and, and they were present in, in great multitudes in Greece and Portugal and Spain. By, by, by the time you get to the, the 14, 1500s, had near entirely gone. Next slide. They knew that the animal was, you know, some sort of water dog. Maybe it had a fish-like tail. Maybe it could swim. Maybe it was like a seal. They just didn't really know. Very few people had actually ever seen a live one. And they knew and appreciated its worth. But they had no, no conception of what the creature, you know, truly was or truly looked like. Next slide. There were attempts made at different times to protect them for their commercial worth. So the Carolingian kings and the, the borders of their old kingdom between Germany and Belgium appointed court officials called Beverari to administer all matters pertinent to the beavers because the beavers were such a valuable creature. They didn't want them to disappear from their kingdoms in their, in their time. They wanted to maintain the presence of this animal so they could have a harvestable resource. But despite the interest of the kings and nobles and their jurisdictions and their edicts, the killing still continued. Next slide. Interestingly, the first time you actually have a people who start to think differently is not in Europe at all. It's not a part of the world that was cultivated and, and civilized and intelligent, that appreciated art and literature and, and a, whole, a whole broad range of things we now associate with ourselves. But long before you know, we, we, we obtained culture at all, in the Fertile Crescent and Middle East, people were thinking differently. So in ancient Iran and Zoroastrian times, 
2,000 years before the birth of Christ, those who kill beavers had to pay a heavy fine of 60,000 dirhams and kill 10,000 tortoises and snakes to compensate for their sins. Next slide. And they had to do that because the animal was thought to be a holy animal. And it was believed to be a holy animal because if you killed a beaver, and the, the drought would come and the desert would advance and the corns and corn and grass would cease to grow until the killer received punishment. It's the first ever thinking with regard to this animal that shows the merest germ of understanding of its role in world ecology. Next slide. As late as 1874, beavers survived in, in, in countries like Syria and Iran in very much diminished numbers, but still they're remarked upon. Sometimes they're captured, sometimes they're recorded um, by, by expeditions um, sent out there to, to, record, to note the flora and fauna from, from, from Western Europe. Next slide. But by the time those expeditions are, are, are going to Syria or Iran or arid Turkey or China or Mongolia, this is the environment they're finding. The climate's changed and the animal that held the water in great abundance and could literally turn the desert green is long dead and gone as a life force. Next slide. And we know what happens when you kill beavers. It's not a, a mystic myth from the Middle Ages. There are good first-hand accounts from North America and Canada of just what happens when you kill the water savers. If you can, guys, get this book, Three Against the Wilderness by Eric Collier. It tells the story of the man who went out to establish a trapping dispensation on something like 10,000 um, acres of land in the Chilcontin range of Canada and, and who basically, whose, whose wife was an Indian and whose mother told him that the forest fires he saw raging throughout, from range to range throughout the valley bottoms year on year and the fur bearers that he looked for in the wetlands that simply weren't there anymore. His wife's mother told him it was never that way when the beavers were there. Next slide. And slowly but surely, he began to realize what we're only coming to terms with now, which is that if you kill the water saver, this massive natural force that engineers day and night with a great degree of intricacy to keep the valley bottoms wet and green, the valley bottoms full of rich silt because they're, they're dam systems systems retain 80% of the silts that are, are washed off the land and of course in the end create great agricultural land. If you kill and remove these animals entirely from a whole landscape, you destroy nature's process which keeps the land wet and which stops fire. Next slide. And if you think that's not the case, this is the last beaver that was ever killed in Greece, I think, early in the 1800s and 1834. This effigy with its pools, poor, sad, shrunken tail has just been found in a museum. And there aren't any live ones there. But a time when we are still debating what we're going to do in Britain, and we're advancing a reintroduction process, which we, we've, we've already told everybody is going to be cautious the first time that word's ever been used by any civilized nation with regard to the restoration process for this very well understood animal cautious at a time of massive ecological and climate change is ridiculous in three weeks time those of uh, myself and several of my colleagues are going to Greece at the invitation of the University of Thessalonica, who have been asked by the Greek government to sort this out and to help restore the water savers quickly to a land which is, is now suffering the most terrifying consequences of aridity and drought and changing climate. Next slide. So there you go, there's your record. 1839 is when that last sad beaver was killed by a French expedition. Next slide. And of course, we in the wet lands 
landscapes that we occupy in Britain, we just don't think like that. We we look at the flooding that comes at Hebden Bridge in the north. You look at towns and communities increasingly being cut off. And it astounds me, absolutely astounds me as a farmer for a large part of my life and a member of the National Farmers Union that people just don't connect these kind of happenings with all the drainage we've done. I was traveling through Britain maybe two years ago with a friend from Eastern Europe. And as we crossed yet another ridge line and descended into a valley, he, he turned to me in the car and said, you know, Derek, he said, the thing I can't come to terms with this in, in this landscape is one, the number of sheep there are and how they're everywhere contained by these things called fences. Because if you tried that in our landscape, the wolves would eat them all. And two, every time we cross a valley ridge, there's not a single wetland in the bottom of those valleys anymore. They've all gone. We have so lost our knowledge of wetlands and our knowledge of the sponges and 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 uh, that they no longer feature in our mindset as a natural natural use of land anymore. But if you eliminate them all, if you take every single last centimetre of the soil there is and drain it, then this in the end is the climate changes and rainfall patterns um, increase is going to be the misery that confronts very many of us living in the low-lying lands. Next slide. And beavers could do much to help us with this. Bear in mind, they are a species that we've had a long relationship with. That relationship has been abusive for many millennia, but it doesn't need to be that way. If we, 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 we do what's right and we act in an intelligent fashion, we can take this creature and harness its abilities to help us restore landscapes, which not only abound with nature, as, as, as should be the case, but which also become once again retentive of water. These are beaver dam systems coming down through a, a landscape that, that falls by by you know, at a 45 degree angle in, in, in Perth. And you can quite clearly see when you look up the dam systems that behind each impoundment, there's pool after pool of water. What you can't see is that wherever the water comes round, either side of the dam or through the dam, there are more impoundments and more water held in those. So that what you're not looking at is one great grand edifice like the Hoover Dam in North America holding by, you know, mile after mile after mile of, of vast lagoon and Rocky Mountain sites. What you're looking at are all these different muddy impoundments and gutters. One of the old names for, or well, the old place names that records the presence of beavers is a place called Beaver Dyke in Yorkshire. And if, if you know what a dyke is, it's, you know, it's just a low impoundment. It's muddy. Maybe it's covered by plants when it matures, but it holds the water all the same. And that's what beavers create naturally as water savers in a landscape. Next slide. And though the relationship we've had is, has been very bad for a very, very long time, it could actually become a relationship that's good. This is Bridge Creek in Oregon, and you can quite clearly see that those beaver dams that span the creek are, 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 are very evenly positioned. And they're very evenly positioned because the State Forest Service has gone across the creek, hammered posts down into its rocky bed, encouraged the beavers to come back out of the side creeks because they couldn't live on, on the flashy old main river anymore after it had been grazed down to nothing by range cattle. And by doing so over years and time, recreated a system which has ensured that the beavers reinforced their structures. Then they, as the water passed around their structures and the, you know, with the beaver reinforcing in place to create side channels, the beavers created more dams there as well. They retained the silts, the woodlands came by, the birds came by, the amphibians came by, and the game fish which had had once been so plentiful in historic times, but was so diminished by the time this, this project began, the steelhead salmon and the coho salmon came back to spawn in, in, in the riffles and, 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 um, and gravel beds that were created beneath the beaver dams, you know, once those were in place. Next slide. And this is what beavers create, it's chaos. There's nothing simple about this. It's trees down, uprooted conifers. It's 
creeks and sunniness and, and lush plant growth, islands, gantries that predators can run run across where the trees fall over to try and catch the ducks that are nesting in the middle of something that's so complex you'd never think it would be possible. And this is the kind of lifescape that, that nature needs. Nature doesn't need tidy landscapes that we, meet, we wish to create ourselves. It needs random chaos um, to find all the living space that it requires. Next slide. If you want to take that random chaos one intelligent step further, when we talk about beaver reintroduction and, 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 it's, and the tentative form it's going to take, well, nobody knows what's going to happen next year when Natural England and, and DEFRA start to license beaver projects, but you can be pretty sure it won't be very ambitious. They'll look to small river systems that are well willowed in the West and say, yes, they can be there after you jump through every artificial hoop that's been manufactured to delay and slow a process mm -hmm. that we should move on with swiftly. But if you want to really think in, into the you know, sensibly about this and, and you want to think future about this, then you go to the poison toxic landscapes of the East where arable farming has done its worst and you start to buy land or you, you, you compulsory purchase land where the ditch systems aggregate with their pesticides and chemicals and toxic silts laden with all sorts of ills before they go out to sea and you allow the beavers to recreate kidneys that filter this filth and hold it in the landscape to again create living space for other creatures. It's the cerebral way of coming to terms with beavers. Next slide. And all life needs them. I've worked with water voles for a quarter of a century, and I have come to the conclusion that everything I've done has been a failure. We've learned a lot. We've learned how this tiny, robust animal that is so critical for life, that's the, the basis of a, a food chain, is a big rodent weighing up to 330 grams with a clean body, not full of rodenticides that complicates bankside environments to create open habitats that grass snakes can bask in to provide refugia for other small mammals and, and for the amphibians that follow them. We know that this little animal is important, but it's gone in my time of working with it from 1.2 million which uh, in, in 2004, which was at a time when it was estimated they'd already lost 97% of their range to 139,000 two years ago to 77,000 now. They're just slipping through our fingers. And when they've gone, we're not going to be able to replace them with anything much at all. And they need beavers because beavers create the open, sunny, pool full landscapes that these little tiny creatures require. They are not architects of their own living space. If the trees shade out the river edges, then the vegetation they require disappears and they go. There's nothing that makes the pools other than beavers. There's nothing that creates the complex canals they so love to live in other than beavers. And without beavers, this little creature is doomed. And without beavers, everything, very many other things too, are just marking time. Next slide. The woodcock that feed in the gutters they create, the, um, the amphibians that return to spawn in great abundance in their pools. In one study in Devon, 10 clumps of frogs spawn in one site, went to fix that 650 clumps in four years. And all these things are food. They are not cultural icons. One of the biggest problems that nature faces in our modern landscapes is that there is very little left for very many predators to eat. And, and much of what there is if, if you get things that once predated water voles and, and they switch to try and feed on brown rats or the last of the dying rabbits, then if they, they are successful in obtaining the rats they're looking for, those rats are full of toxins that we put in their bodies. And those toxins in the end kill their predators too. This bird is a little grebe, and every year on a pond in Wales where a pair of beavers live with their kits, um, that is shallow, it rears two clutches of tiny chicks. And it raises those clutches of tiny chicks because every time that beaver moves round the pond at night, it so stirs the leaf detritus up that the invertebrates, the aquatic insects, that the grebe fills it feeds on, just rise in plumes around the beaver, and the bee and the grebe has a rich living environment because of that. 
this bird needs that animal and the relationship they both have is millions of years old. They understand each other well. They no need no lesson from us on how to live again. Next slide. And beavers bring surprises. There is a vast guild of lost creatures that we can't even begin to comprehend as being one British. When Geraldus Cambrensis, the person that wrote about beavers, or the Tyvee in the 1170s said it was the only river in, in, in Britain where there were beavers, that same man two years later went to Ireland. And when he got to Ireland, he said, well, there are many swans here, but very few storks and all the storks are black. It's almost certain that this wonderful bird was once a breeding bird in Britain, but we drained the wetlands, we took their living space, we killed the beavers that made the pool systems and the forests they adore, which are full of great water beetles and frogs and small fish, and ensured that there was no living space and no food. And then when they came again in Victorian times, you know, blown over as vagrants from Europe, we killed them all and we stuffed them and put them in glass cages. This bird has been recorded for the first time in a thousand years, three years ago, feeding in a beaver-generated wetland in Scotland. They've returned to countries like Belgium, where they weren't a quarter of a century ago, because the reintroduced beavers there have created exactly the sort of living spaces they need, and nature's capable still of providing surprises if we give it the ability to restore itself. Next slide. So it's down to us. We can act in the worst of ways. We can bludgeon them. We can we can snare them. We can we can shoot them in the face with shotguns that are not capable of killing them properly. So they bleed out in agony and die on the banks of the Tay. Or we can say enough. This is not right. This is an action that's just wrong. And at a time when these animals are so rare and so valuable in Britain, that despite all the rubbish that's said by ignorant anglers and stupid, greedy farmers, we should be reintroducing them wherever we can. This should not be. They're much more valuable than, than, than for their lives to end in this way. Next slide. We have to move on to better times. History is a terrible thing. It always shows us that when you give uh, the power to kill to people who hate, then their hatred knows no depths. And they will scalp, as they did for this poster in the 1700s, every male Penobscot Indian they can find to get that bounty of $70 because they hate so much and they want that money um, you know, to, to, you know, uh, worse than sin itself. It's the wrong thing to do. Next slide. Animals, people that get in the way, everything of that sort, be it a predator or a beaver or an aborigine or a, or a, or a, or a Piedmon River person, they're vermin and they're their way of progress. And if you think um, that we've changed at all, just look at some of the statements that have been put out by the Scottish National Farmers Union and you'll see in their very intent that intellectually we have not moved very far at all. Civilization demands of its leaders that they temper this sort of abomination um, with, with thinking which, which is, is different. We must not go back into the dark at this time. We must move forward. Next slide. And that means we look at science and the truth. That means that, you know, in a time of, of global emergency, when David Attenborough stands on a stage at COP and Boris bounces up and down and you have world leaders there in the ranks and Greta's going blah, blah, blah outside with a microphone, that you look at your people declaring extinction emergencies and you say, well, what are you doing beyond words? You've made a statement, but what are you actually going to do? What are the issues, issues that you're going to tackle? The things that are thorny and difficult, where some of the people you're responsible for administering just say no, or they go slow, or they don't do their job. It is an emergency, and if it's an emergency, we should be acting quickly and swiftly and rationally with science at our side. We shouldn't just be kicking cans down the road. Next slide. 
There are people who have acted well on behalf of this creature, and this man is one of them. He 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 made a a a, a history for himself as Grey Owl. He was arch actually Archie Bellini from Hastings, but he again went out to North America as a trapper. He killed many beavers and many other animals. And eventually, towards the end of his career, when he was an older man, his wife made him hand rear two baby beavers whose parents he'd executed the day before for their fur and who, which were crying and starving on the lodge um, that he passed again the following day in his canoe. And gradually, slowly, as he came to terms with these two tiny things and, and they grew and they prospered and he went for walks in the forest with them, with them walking as they sometimes do as a beaver on their hind legs, reaching up to his, to his hands so they could hold his fingers and their tiny paws, he became appalled by his own actions. This animal could be an old friend returning and we should be welcoming it back. Next slide. We need them to provide food. We need to fill the larders of nature full again without arguing, without putting off the moment when we say we don't want five populations of pool frogs in the east of England. We want tens of hundreds of thousands of the things squawking through every wetland these beavers create. Next slide. We need to re-understand some of the creatures that we think of as only living in certain limited habitats and realize that things like sand lizards don't always need to live in sand dunes or coastal heaths. They can live inland and, and, and bask on beaver dams and then drop down into the depths of their waters to re-emerge, um, bobbing happily up to stretch their, their, their bodies out on a floating piece of wood to catch the insects that come there as well. We don't know anything like as much about nature and ecology as we like to think we do. Next slide. So it's going to be a relearning process for us as well. If you look at the Observer's Book of British Birds from the 1950s, it will tell you that this tiny bird, the red-backed shrike or the butcher bird, likes to live in heathland and, and, and thorn, and it's called the butcher bird because it impales its, 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 its food in the thorns to feed its chicks with later. It makes larders. Well, three years ago, there was one pair of these wee tiny birds tried to rear two chicks in a nest on the edge of Dartmoor. It was a cold, wet spring, and Dartmoor is vast, and there were so few insects that they failed. The people who were looking after them, um, you know, the Forestry Commission, who were charged with running Shrite Watch so that nobody stole their eggs, um, said we were thinking about feeding them with crickets from a pet shop because the provender was so poor. That's two birds that are trying to rear chicks that are maybe an inch, an inch and a half in length, and they can't find enough insects on Dartmoor. We have environments that are green, but are very, very ill. And if we are serious in our tent when it comes to changing those, we have to act now. Next slide. And the beaver could deliver so much more. Britain doesn't need to be an island that's devoid of life, where there are no spectacles, where we just think, you know, if we, we hear one barn owl at night, that that's a special event, a special happening, something that's truly unique. It doesn't need to be that way. We've made the landscape the way it is. We've engineered it to suit ourselves for different purposes um, that at the time seemed right. Now, when we know they're wrong and that a different kind of partnership has to emerge, one where there's certainly farming, there are other land use industries, but we have to make space for nature as well, then what could possibly be wrong with that? And the great wetlands, the beavers, you know, we will easily engineer, could provide living space for so many other life forms that we don't think of at all. Next slide. So there we are. We're not dealing with an ancient beaver anymore. We're not dealing with something that we have to, to, to slaughter and kill for its teeth for dice or because we want its porky meat, um, which we don't, if we don't strip the fat from, taste like turpentine. We could be dealing with a thoroughly modern beaver. And what a treat that would be. Next slide. 
So just bear in mind when you listen to all the nonsense that that, that, that spews forth in the press and the people who tell you we can't have them, they're an animal of the past, this is no longer possible in our arable drained environments and that their dams will stop them out of the movement of migratory fish with which they have lived for over 40 million years, that these are not a keystone species. They are an ecological process in their own right and we will have no fit life going forward on this island, they're deep in this planet, unless we start to do something as a species ourselves, which we've not been good at doing in historical terms. And that is to show understanding and tolerance of creatures that are vital, not only for, for, for the well-being of so many other species, but for our own well-being as well. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Derek, thank you so much. I'm just going to mute you um, to stop any um, <coughs> interference from the mic. But thank you so much for that. Uh, thoroughly enjoyable, um, full of uh, passion as ever. Um, and just, yeah, it's such a reminder um, of how degraded our landscapes are and that, that concept of shifting baseline. And I'm sure many people in, on the call might have memories of their childhood and a, a more diverse landscape. Um, that, that we have today. Um, so we'll, we'll open up to some questions now. Um, so if, if people would like to um, either uh, type into the chat or raise your hand and I will take off the unmute function so that you can unmute yourself um, and ask a question directly if you, if you like. Um, I, could I could start one to sort of kick us off. Um, actually, we, we did speak a long time ago and I was, when we first appointed this project um, and read a couple of the, the sort of famous Beaver books, um, what the Ben Goldfarb one, and, and so kind of was super aware of their uh, potency and, you know, as you said, as like an ecological process. And my question is, um, you know, in, in a landscape like the River Stour, you know, we, where might you in, introduce them? Because, you know, the main channel wouldn't be um, suitable. Uh, which is something I think we discussed. So is that something, Derek, where you're looking at introducing them to the drainage ditches around the landscape? And, you know, what might that intro introduction look like? You know, might you have to make sure they've got um, a right, you know, adequate food source to get them going? So I'll just unmute you now. You have to unmute yourself there. Reintroducing beavers is as easy as falling off a stationary bus. You can't really go very far wrong. All they need is about three kilos of vegetation per day, grasses, trees, sedges, whatever, and, and water. That's it. They'll live right in the middle of Christchurch. They will find space. If you want evidence of that, you go to, oh, is it Froome now? It's on the Bristol Avon. And the beavers have built a sodding great lodge right at the back of the um, Asda Superstore. Everybody that drives in and out past the Superstore never even notices it there. And that's where the beavers are living. There, there's nothing special about what they want or need. If they decide that they're going to stick a lodge to a concrete wall, they're perfectly capable of doing it. So all you need to do is wisely, you'd look up and down the star, you'd find some wooded pool systems and you'd put them in there to begin with. So the animals have got a decent living, decent living situation with stable water um, and easy forage. And if you did that, they'd be fine. They'd sit, settle in there, have their babies and go on from there. But it's not complicated and you'd easily find good living space for beavers on a river like the Stour. Thanks, Derek. That's, uh, that's yeah, great to hear. Um, any questions from anyone else here? Yes, John, you've got your hand up there. You should be able to unmute yourself. <clears throat> You able to unmute yourself there? There we go. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for the for that uh, talk. It was really interesting. I had no idea um, that beavers could be so um, have have a, such a positive effect on the environment. But I live very near the New Forest, and I'm just wondering if um, if the small, mostly small streams running through the forest could benefit from beavers or, or could support beavers. Derek, I'll just have to unmute you again. The, the new forest is unusual. It depends on grazing intensity. I've seen some forest mires 
um, where there's more than adequate understory and vegetation and cover and, and provision for beavers, but where the grazing of big herbivores is, is as intense as it can be in areas of the forest and everything is mown down to nothing and there is no riparian edge habitat at at all, you just have torn lawn, then yes, they would have difficulties. And the other difficulty that would arise is that when they took down tree species that would naturally recoppice, then of course they won't recoppice because there are too many ponies, too many deer, too many cattle, too many of our animals um, destroying the environment that would otherwise respond to them. So it, it, it would be some and some in the new forest. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, one from Roger, please. Yeah, thank you. I'm quite interested in the idea of uh, introducing beavers to particular localities, but the landscape is so fragmented at the moment, this is one of the problems with all kinds of species, is how it's possible for them subsequently to link up and spread around the countryside. They'll, they'll move huge. Uh, can, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Right, I'm quite losing track of all the muting and unmuting. Right, they will. Sp what all that happens is you have high quality habitat, they are small territories. If you have poor quality habitat, they have large territories and they can move vast difference distances through a water course to find other beavers. I mean, probably 30, 40 miles a night, no problem at all. They're big barrel shaped animals. All they need to do is, is cork along the river and they're just fine. They'll move through all the environments we've made without any problem. If you go to intensely used human landscapes like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, take your pick. There are beavers living in the middle of Salzburg. There are beavers living on the Worm in Munich. There are be beavers will easily adapt and cope with our river systems. No problem. It's down to whether we are, we are, we are able to show the degree of tolerance um, towards their activities that would be required. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Derek. Any other questions then? I just, um, I might add that we uh, have some of the National Trust, um, an archaeologist who, who discovered a beaver tooth that was dated uh, two and a half, three thousand years old um, down on the water meadows. That one of the sites that, that um, relate to the park. So, yeah, maybe just a for reintroduction there. Uh, Tim, you wanted to say something there. Thank, thank you. I mean, um, yeah, Derek, I mean, it seems that the door is open with the Water Framework Directive of 2003, which is obviously law uh, for England and Wales. The river systems have been mapped now by 2015. Um, would you agree with the fact that where the Water Framework Directive correctly, or by Otto going up and down streams, wants to remove weirs and dams, beavers have semi-permeable dams, which are not caught by the legislation. So it seems that you know, the reintroduction of beavers is complementary with the Water Framework Directive. And just one other last question, if I may, which is related. It seems that beavers, um, please confirm, Derek, notwithstanding the points you made earlier, would like the heads of rivers. If they were more at the heads of rivers, there would be this conflict with lowland farmers perhaps would disappear. No, the conflict with lowland farmers wouldn't disappear because we use everything. Our flood yeah, well, walls the sides of the yeah. rivers have 20 meter margins between the river and the water because we want everything. We want it all. Understood. Understood. But the yeah. conflict will, will, will be there until we grow up and realize that we can't have it all. We can either have the croplands or we can have village schools fl flooded and full of sewage year yeah. after year, twice or th you know, two or three times in a winter season with the situation getting steadily worse. Yes, they're entirely complementary with regard to the, the objectives of the Water Framework Directive. They deliver natural solutions. Um, right. They're engineers, that's what they do. And no, they don't prefer to build dams at all because they're lazy like us. If they've got the opportunity, what they want to do is float up and down big rivers, feeding on herbs, <laughs> digging holes in the banks and having an easy life. <laughs> Maintaining dam systems is bloody hard work, and they prefer to do it if they have to. Right, with you. Okay, thank and, you. I mean, and that's what makes them a marvelous species. So they prefer smaller streams rather than big rivers. They prefer big rivers. Big river rivers are easy living. The small streams are hard work. But it's a complex okay. 
relationship they have with catchments. So that if you live on the big rivers, it's an easy life. But if the floods come and the water comes up, you die. And and the ones in the in the smaller tri the smaller tribs and side streams are the ones that survive. They're the ones that have to work hard for a living. But then they survive events like that, and their babies recolonize the easy living. So the easy living is is something you can't trifle with. You have too much um, too much port and stake, and sooner or later in life it catches up with you. And it's the same for beavers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Roger, put your hand up again there. Yes, thank you. This is a bit tangential to the main topic. But, I mean, I guess everybody who is listening to this presentation tonight is interested in biodiversity and the lots of biodiversity in the country and, and worldwide. I'm just wanting to encourage everybody to write to their, um, uh, their, their representatives, their democratic representatives, urging them to take action because the loss of biodiversity is a global problem and we need global solutions. And I would just like to encourage everybody to uh, take an active part and at least write to their MP. Thank you. You have Thank to get you, a message like better and shout and scream. It's shocking. Don't accept anybody else is going to sort it out. People change everything. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. And, and how valuable the tool the beaver can be, as you say, I think you, you put that so eloquently, Derek, um, just you know, utilizing this amazing uh, species and, and, and working and coexisting with them. And I know in, you know, like the, the work of Gerhardt in Bavaria, you know, um, very, very urban populations and farmers um, coexisting with beavers very seamlessly. And I think that's Absolutely beautiful. You just have to have the will to do it in the first instance. And then you have to pick up the blueprint from countries like Bavaria and not reinvent a wheel that you understand nothing about at all, which is very good at doing in Britain. <laughs> and I had, a, I had a question with uh, no more with the hands up. I'll just mute for a sec. Um, we, we, had some, we have a group of anglers uh, or several anglers who fish the, the lower reaches of the Stour um, who are interested in um, or, or concerned about, you know, what, what would the impacts of, of the beavers be to the fish populations? Now, I'm, I have my views on that, and I would assume that generally the fish, fish populations would rise as a result of the, um, the, 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 the invertebrates, et cetera. But Derek, maybe you just speak a little bit about, um, about that, if you might. And I just, again, had to, had to meet you there because of the feedback. So. It's, it's complex. I mean, basically what happens is that you get many pools, you get more aquatic invertebrates. They ri ri um, rise in, 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 in abundance of biomass by 80%. Beavers create um, riffles by felling trees. They create complex woody bundles underwater, which frack uses refugia from cormorants and, and, and from other predators. You know, beavers, you know, there's been a study done just recently by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust that shows that beaver ge generated landscapes with pools full of insects and complexity give you bigger trout you know this, this the beavers and fish have lived together for 40 million years we're the ones that have screwed it up with our canalization of rivers and pesticides and contaminants and sewage and 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 silts the idea that there's a there's, there's an imicable effect on on beavers from fish is quite simply ridiculous there's no evidence at all that's significant to suggest that and the evidence there is that's scientifically peer approved shows quite the contrary that beavers have a beneficial effect on fish the problem is that you've got a whole bunch of you've got a bunch of people whose 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 narrative is that they want to save the atlantic salmon and that's just it and they really couldn't care less about water bowls or dippers or or anything else that they have to sacrifice on the altar you know to of, the, of their one great god so even if it made any sense to save one species everything else would have to suffer perish and die because you're trying to save one fish uh, it's absolutely crazy and as i say there's no evidence at all that beavers and migratory have any deleterious effect on migratory salmonids if you were speaking oh, yeah. to the north Americans, they would laugh themselves silly at the prospect and tell you, you can't recover migratory game fish without beavers simple as that yeah i mean that that, that was what I, I remember strongly yeah thank you any any other questions before we let Derek get back and finish off his beer? Okay, one from Tracy um, from the National Trust. 
Hi, I just Hi. want to ask you, Derek, if you have a view on where we might get some more licenses for beaver releases in Dorset, Purbeck area, of particular interest. So we had to, had to meet you again there, Derek. Okay, I do not speak for Natural England. They tell us that they're going to be 20 released next year. To be quite honest, there aren't enough beavers to run that. So we'll just have to see what this licensing process involves. I mean, the, the licensing process for the enclosures has been incredibly painful at times, needlessly so. You know, keep two pairs of entirely benevolent animals in a pen. You know, it's just, I honestly despair. I mean, there are times when you listen to what to a, to a Greta saying, and I, I disagree with very little that girl says, and it's just blah, blah, blah. It's commitments, it's people grandstanding, and when it actually comes down to, to delivering an end result, you know, we fall very far short. I would hope that progress now will be swift, but um, the experience suggests that it might not be. Okay, thank you. Tracy, any other questions from anyone else? We wrap up this evening. Um, lastly, I'll just say really inspiring to hear that the, the Greeks, um, the Greek government have, have invited you out. I mean, really amazing, particularly after um, their fires um, earlier this year. And, and yeah. yeah. They're taking it seriously. We're still farting around. Yeah. <laughs> Quite. Well, it's hopefully, Derek, thank you so much. Um, really great to see you. And thank you for bringing all of that this evening and um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you uh, down in the lowest hour for some release programmes in the forthcoming years. I'll be speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Bye.